What's up guys, Michael here, season three, talk about it. Today we're joined by Danny Kerr with Breakthrough Academy. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. What's up, guys? We're back here. Season three, talk about it. Today, we're joined by Danny Kerr of Breakthrough Academy. Uh, Danny, thanks so much for jumping on with us today. Yeah, thanks for having us, Michael. Absolutely. So I've got some breakfast tacos here. I'm going to enjoy those. You've got some great advice for us. Um, before we jump into the advice, maybe give the uh, those that aren't familiar with yourself and Breakthrough just a little high level of your background in the industry and then what Breakthrough Academy is. Sure. Yeah, um, I started actually my own contract business when I was 18 within a franchise organization. So I ran a franchise for a while and um, it taught me a lot about systems. It taught me a lot about, you know, being a good contractor, but more importantly, it taught me about how to be a good business owner. And um, I did that for a few years, ended up working into corporate and managing, you know, with a few other partners actually about half the country with that franchise organization and just really saw myself personally just like, a, I love coaching and developing people more than I love contracting. <laughs> so that was a big realization. Yeah. But B, just like how much you can make an impact on somebody who knows how to be a contractor but doesn't know how to run the business side of it. And I thought, wouldn't it be neat if you created like a franchise system but without the franchise itself? All the training and development, all the culture and community, all the coaching and, and all the accountability that you get in a franchise organization but just release it to the public and call it coaching, right? Quote unquote. And, um, and that's what we did. So about five and a half years ago, uh, me and a couple uh, partners from that organization band together and we created something called Breakthrough Academy, which is now, you know, I think we have about three, just over 300 companies that report into us every two weeks and a team of 25. And basically what we've tried to do is create a business management process or system for the trades industry. You know, how do you manage your financials, org structure, job descriptions? How do you train your people? How do you hold accountability to the entire organization and make sure it grows sustainably and not in some uncontrolled fashion? And um, took off like wildfire, obviously, and been traveling with you guys all over the States and many others and getting the word out. And uh, yeah, it's been neat. It's been, a, it's been a cool endeavor. I've noticed this industry is highly underprofessionalized and a lot of people are seeking a lot of what we do, but it's not really taught properly. So we've been able to, yeah, provide a pretty valuable, not only message on how to organize your business effectively, but also build out all the systems for it. So we give our contractors complete playbooks on everything and let them go operate and, and implement what we do. You bet. And I, well, when I sent the questionnaire out saying like, Hey, what would be the best advice you could share with contractors? I was, I was excited to see what you were going to share with us and you know i was like hey hopefully he's got something good here i love having you on um i was really really excited when i saw the advice because it was a little different than i expected you know i was expecting where you're talking systems and processes there i thought it's for sure and i know that some of your advice may go to the systems and processes but you said that it's important to take time away from the day-to-day -to, -day to make sure that you're steering the uh the ship uh, in the right direction. Maybe elaborate a little bit on that and then we'll dive into some questions. Sure. Um, the reason I give that advice is because advice, even myself, I need to listen to, right? Um, when you're a business owner, especially most of us who started the company, like we're, a lot of us are just born and bred entrepreneurs, right? And that comes with a certain territory. Not everybody's exactly the same as me, obviously, but a lot of people are idea-driven people. They're very fast moving. They know how to implement stuff very quickly and get results very quickly. And when you're in startup mode, everyone's praising your name, being like, man, like, how did you do that? That's incredible. How did you grow so fast? And everyone's complimenting you for that. And if anything, I found myself and a lot of people like even coach and break their academy, they're very proud of that. I work extremely hard. I'm extremely practical. I go out and do it when everyone else talks about it, right? And there is massive value to that. And what I've noticed, not only within our members, but even within myself over time, is that as an organization grows and evolves, that owner's initial like piss and vinegar that drives that organization has to be pulled back a little bit and be given to the team. And it's hard to run a team and hard to develop yourself and your organization if you're the one doing everything, if you're the engine that everybody relies on. Um, I remember years ago, I was, I was like 20 years old. Um, I was kind of in my first kind of leg, you know, a couple of years of, of running my own little business. And one of my members came up to me or my staff came up to me and they're like, Danny, like, 
you are like I can't do this without you. Like we, we all rely on you and they called it Danny Octane. They're like, I like are my week doesn't go that well unless you are helping me drive the week. And I was at first I was very proud of that. And over time I started realizing this is gonna be a problem because I only got so much gas in my tank. <laughs> yeah. And my team is growing and they want more and more and more from me. And nothing happens without me. And um up till that point, I didn't see it as a weakness and I started to and I started to wonder and understand what does it actually take to like run an organization that doesn't necessarily require you in the day to day every single day? Um, and I think a lot of us ask that question and it's a challenging one to unravel. I think it's very unnatural for a lot of us who are startup people to step back and go from what I call like the grassroots level entrepreneur to more like the enterprise level entrepreneur. And I'll be the first to put my hand up and say, I still haven't figured it all out, but what I did figure out is how to bring people around me that can help with that. You know, I've got a couple of business partners that are very opposite to my skill set and bring that more enterprise level piece to our organization um, at Breakthrough Academy. And it's kind of something that a lot of us as entrepreneurs need to learn. As, as we grow, it, you, what got you to that first level of success isn't necessarily going to get you to that next level. So that's what we'll talk about a bit. Absolutely. So I think probably I've got a couple questions off of that, but probably the first one that comes to mind is how do I, how do I start to achieve that? Because I think that's probably... You know, it's, it's just like anything. The first step is probably the hardest. How do I, do I go in and schedule maybe a couple hours a day where my calendar's blocked off? I, I have an idea of what I want to do as a business owner, but it's blocked off so that it gives me that opportunity to step away from the day to day. Or what is your advice on how do you get that first step going? I think the first step before you can real, is, yes, you could do that. And have wishful thinking that you'll actually spend some time on a Friday afternoon on your business or whatever it is. But the reality is you're going to get sucked into something, right? And, I, and I've mm -hmm. experienced that time and time again. And I think the first step that I ever did that really helped me was I actually just sat down and like wrote out what I do, what everyone else in the team does. I actually did it just literally not in a job description, but just in Excel. I just like made these lists in Excel, like what are all the things I do? What's all the things my project manager does? What are all the things my team does? Like, my administrative people, like what does everybody do? And then I started to organize it in a way that was more, more conducive to like my strengths and other people's strengths. And I started to offload things, simple things for me, like doing crew moves, right? Why am I still doing crew moves? My project management team should and can do it. Why weren't they? Well, they're like, Danny, we don't have ladders on our vehicle to take around the, uh, the uh, or sorry, um, roof racks on our, our vehicle to take around the ladders. And I started to problem solve little things like that that seem arbitrary, but gave me suddenly like five more hours a week where I wasn't doing crew moves, right? Um, I had to clear some stuff off my plate. And I guess the biggest advice I'd say to anybody is first, look at all the things you do in a week, circle the stuff that's highest time consumption and lowest skill, and start to look at either how to delegate those things, or if there's enough of those things, that's the next role you should be hiring for. Whether that's administrative stuff, whether that's sales driven stuff, or whether that's production management stuff, those are the things that are going to, you know, Basically, somebody else can do for a 20 or 10 or $30 an hour job so that gave you time to do your $100, $200 an hour job, which is managing around the company. So that, that's it. the first step, I would say, to anybody. Is just You can't put more things on a plate of somebody who's already too busy to do all the things they have on their plate. So. No, I think that's, that's perfect. Build that list of, hey, what am I doing? What does employee A do? What does employee B do? What things on my plate? don't need to be on my plate. And I, that kind of brings me to my next question. I think a lot of times owners have the mentality, especially early on of, you know, I got us to here. Nobody cares as much or nobody can do it as well as I, I do it. Um, how important is it to, and I see if you have any suggestions on this, let go of some of that and, you know, build that trust in your team. Uh, obviously it's important. Maybe speak to the importance of it, but then some tips on how do I finally let that go? Because that's your baby as an owner. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a myth or a lie we tell ourselves, right? There's, 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 if we're really honest, we look out into the world, there's plenty of very large organizations where the owner does not do everything, right? It's mm -hmm. usually in small business that you see that and you hear the mentality of like, I'm the only one that can do this. And, and, and in some semblances, they're right because that's how they built their organization where they're the one that does everything. But they've also locked themselves into their own self-fulfilling prophecy, right? By doing that and saying that and repeating that to their team, everyone believes that now and that's the only feedback they hear back to themselves. Um, yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, you have to sit down. I, you know what, I will say actually this. I took a course in something called situational leadership. 
It was a simple three-day class. Um, there's probably a lot more depth I could have gotten into it, but I got enough away from it where I realized there was a bit of a missing factor in my ability to transition skill. And what that was, was I, everyone has, what I learned is four different leadership types. So there's people that are high, high, high direction. There's people that are a little bit more like coaching based. So they'll involve the person in what's going on, but they'll essentially still have the final decision. Then there's like high support. So you are just asking really good leadership questions. Like, why do you think it would happen that way? Like someone would say, how do we, you know, whatever, what should we use for estimating standard? And you go, well, what do you think? And getting them to start to be self, you know, problem solvers. So that's more like the support phase. And then there's people that are high delegators who so just like, go do it, get it done. And then they don't, and they get disappointed, right? Now, what I noticed is I was doing two things. I was like high, 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 like direction. I was like, go do it this way, exactly like this, exactly like follow me, go. And then I would switch to high delegation. Okay, now you got it, go, see ya. Like you get it. You followed me for a week, have at her. And I was missing these two little in-between pieces where I'm like coaching them and supporting them to grow in their role. And that little course, it was the same time I took something we'll talk about in a little bit on priority management and time scheduling, but that little course helped me look at my people and say, look, like this person needs high direction. You know, maybe next month we'll move them to more of like, like I'll start coaching them, involving them and in why the decisions are made the way they're made, but I'll still make the final call. So now at least they're seeing how things get done. Their confidence isn't super high yet because they're still used to having me lead the way. So then I'll move them into support where I'm going to slowly have, every time they come to me to, to have a quick answer, I'm going to force it slower to do. I'm going to force them to problem solve those issues and be there to help direct them. And then finally, once they've proven it to themselves that they know how to get something done and they have the skill to do it and they have the confidence, I can move them into delegation phase where they can go take that task on. But that's not even per person, that's per task. So if I've got someone who's really good at sales but really struggles in using the CRM and inputs of that CRM, I might be like high direction on the inputs and high delegation or high coaching um, on, the, on, the, on the actual sales side, right? So I'm, I'm slowly building into my people and slowly relinquishing control and things in a very like methodical manner where I'm not being reckless, I'm not just delegating, but, and I'm not being super controlling and trying to teach them everything and just do it all my way or else you fail but slowly helping them evolve as individuals. And as I did that, some of these tasks started to come off my plate. And it was, it was a bit more of, a, it was more of an intentional focus over time, but it allowed my team to be, believe in their own abilities and their ability to get stuff done, and in me, in, in, or in my ability to know that they were doing things properly because I spent the time with them to do it. So. Yeah, no, that's, I think that's awesome advice and like taking them through the process there like you were talking about because I think, you know, you talked about that self-fulfilling prophecy up front and it's really easy to re and, you know, make that self-fulfilling proce- prophecy even more true when you say, oh, I'm a delegator and here's the task I delegated. It doesn't get done the way I want it to be done. It's like, oh, I guess I'll just have to do it myself. You know, and, and it's not their fault. It's because you left out all of these steps of this is how to do it. This is why to do it, helping them through that. So I think that's awesome. Awesome advice. Uh, let's go ahead and take a quick break. And when we get back, I know you mentioned uh, priority management. Let's, uh, you know, dive into that a little deeper. So we'll take a quick break and we'll be right back. Let's talk about it. Hey guys, remember if you do have questions, go ahead and comment below. At the end of the season, we're going to be going live with a special guest and we'll get all those questions answered for you. Let's talk about it. What's up, guys? We're back. Uh, Danny Kerr, Breakthrough Academy. Uh, Danny, I, when we left, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about you know priority management, time, those kind of things. So. Great advice up front of build that list. What things do I want to get off my plate? We talked about how we can maybe start moving some of those things off of our plate. What does what does that time now look like in a practical sense? You know, how do I make sure that I'm maximizing that time and avoiding just filling my plate right back up with day to day tasks? Yeah, it's um, I will say this is very tempting too. You know, it's very easy to be like, this week I got to get this done. It's super important and it's super urgent and we got to do it now. And um, it's easy for you and your team to plug your time full of just random stuff all week. Um, I'm, I'm guilty of this. I've, I've fallen into this, you know, different times throughout the year to this, to this day. Um, but I will say one thing. My business partner does a very good job of forcing us to sit down every single year. We build what's called a one-page strategic plan. So we do this in December. 
we figure out first what are our goals so numerically like what do we want to hit in revenue what do we want to hit in new members what do we want to hit like every single like goal that's numerical gets written down then we go below that and we say what are the initiatives what are the big things that need to be in place for this to be able to be a functional like part of our organization do we need to you know build a tra crm system or a transition to a new crm system do we need to hire a few key staff members and key roles and so we think through for literally a day and a half like what are those initiatives and we take time before Christmas hits to just think through that because it's very easy not to think through it and then just react every month to what seems important. But doing it at the end of the year, right before Christmas, when things are kind of slow and dead, um, we get away to a cabin with zero cell reception and just really process that. Um, once we think through those initiatives, we think through the quarter. Q1, of all these initiatives, which ones are we going to work on? Okay, we're going to work on this one and just this one. Okay, just these two. Okay, great. What are all the things that have to get done for those things? So if it's, let's say, implementing a CRM system, research has to be done. One has to be selected. An implementation plan has to be done. A migration of data has to be done. A, t a documenting of SOPs or standard processes to use that CRM has to be done for the staff. A training has to be done with the staff. An upkeep of training throughout the weeks has to be done to make sure they know how to do everything. Like there's a huge like step-by-step -step, like phase you can you can write out and then you can realize, huh, if that's the stuff that needs to get done then, I'll, t I'll put my hand up to take on that. You know, James, do you want to take on this other initiative? Okay, great. Now next week, what am I doing? While I'm doing that first step, I'm researching CRMs. And now that time that I have in my calendar that I could just plug with random stuff gets plugged from things from that strategic plan. And so, you know, my, my best time is on a Friday and I usually try and keep, you know, 12 to five if I can open on a Friday. It's five hours a week. It's just time to slowly work on the business, put in time towards the initiatives we committed to. Because I've got a goal not only to hit a metric by the end of the quarter, but to get a certain initiative done by the end of the quarter. And that level of like forethought helps you stay focused and stay on track to what's really important. And along the way, throughout that quarter, all kinds of distractions and reasons not to do that come along. But if you've really thought through it properly, you can stay the course. And then every single quarter, we sit down for a day and do a review. Okay, how did that quarter go? What did we get done? What did we not get done? And what's next quarter's biggest focus? So we're not being too like big picture and setting the goal for the whole year, but we're, we're adjusting mm -hmm. along the way as things change. AK, things changed in the last quarter, right? <laughs> we had a big economic shift. And what happened in January is a little different than what's happening now. That said, there's still a lot of very relevant things to get done. And I still have to sit down and make sure I've got these two initiatives or one initiative I'm focused on is slowly being worked on. So it's done by the end of the quarter. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm I'm thinking, and this is just from working with contractors a lot. One thing that they talk about a lot is, you know, how to improving sales and getting more leads, marketing those kind of things. What would that maybe look like for you know, say I do, you know, block out twelve to five on a Friday. I want to work on my marketing. Um, <clears throat> Is that just a, hey, I, I'm going to go do, 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 or do you suggest that it's more on a process so that now in Q2, 3, 4, next year, that it just kind of d runs itself? Yeah, you'll find the bigger your business gets, the harder it is to turn the ball in, in a day or in a week. I think things take a while. <clears throat> um, I know that's for sure true with us. An example of this would be, you know, we, we're going to go work on, we're going to go get more leads or whatever. We're going to go from 300 leads a quarter to 500 leads a quarter. Okay, well, how are we going to do that? Well, first off, you know, I'll just give you some examples of steps, but like, let's analyze where all of our leads are current coming, currently coming from. What are all the sources? How many of those leads are converting? And it's called a lead source distribution chart. So you can figure out where the, the ROI actually is. Once you identify your top three lead sources, then you ask yourself, what are things that could be done to improve them? And you look for the ones that have the biggest room for improvement. You're like, okay, you know what? It's our door-to-door -door marketing process, our strategy. That one's the most scalable. That's gonna be the initiative for this coming quarter. Okay, then you go into that and you say, what are all the things that need to be done for that? Well, it looks like right now, Jim's team door-to-door -door is closing one in every 10 leads, uh, one in every door 10 doors that they go knock on, and Johnny's team is closing one in every 20. So our goal is to try and get Jim's team to be emulated, whatever they're doing, to be emulated to the rest of the team. And so then you break down a list of like, I'm going to go spend a day with Jim. I'm going to get to document what he's doing. I'm then going to go through the other teams and see where their deficiencies are. I'm then going to hold a training session and start to train them on the differences. And then I'm going to do an update every week with them and show them how they're doing on their, on their goals versus actuals for like door to, to sale ratio. We're going to hold accountability to that. And then every two weeks, I'm going to do a bit of training with these teams to help in, in, you know, invest in their skill. 
And so those are all like ideas that might come out of like a quarterly sit down with yourself or with your team. And then those are all like plug inable little ideas that once a week you can go and slowly first problem solve and work out what is the problem that you're trying to solve, get down to the root issue, and then start to attack it one little idea at a time, broken down. That that's absolutely perfect, Danny. It's it's one of those things where a lot of times you say, uh, I'm going to confuse their names. I think it was Jim was doing good. And sure, John Jim and John. Was, I don't know. <laughs> Jim and John. I think Jim's was the good team. And a lot of times people jump from, okay, Jim's doing one in 10, Johnny's doing one in 20. And they jump right to, Johnny, man, you guys, you've got to pick it up. You know, you've got to get to where you're doing one in 10. That's the goal. We've got to hit it. And they wash their hands of it and they step back and say, get it done. And obviously you just hit on a whole bunch of pieces in there to help get them to get to that one in 10. And I'm going to guess as you're doing that, you're also going to be able to make Jim's team better as well. You're going to find little things that you can say, hey, maybe we should try this with Jim's team. Or, hey, it looks like the vast majority of the yeses we're getting happen when we do X, Y, or Z. Maybe we can get Jim's down to one and seven then. You know, just putting that time in, I think that's so important and putting those processes in. I'm really not big on plugging companies in this. It's more just pure advice. But... The one thing I love about BTA is you guys have so many resources and a lot of those resources you're just open with and you will share to people. Um, so guys, if if there's a resource or Danny mentioned something, he's got just a library full of things that he's willing to share. Um, check out BTA, reach out to Danny, connect with him uh, because a lot of these things, I'm guessing you already have them in. You're a spreadsheet king, man. And uh, I'm guaranteeing you've got these things in spreadsheets and different, you know, org charts to help you understand, like, this is the process. This is how I do these things. Um, so break this down from the beginning. Build that list of tasks. What am I doing? What's my team doing? What things do I not need to have on my plate? And then we start to train to get those things off of the plate it's not just a here you go john this shouldn't be on my plate figure it out good luck and then now it's hey i'm going to maximize my time how do i kind of tie this all together so that it's repeatable it's not you know because I, I think it's going to be a decent amount of time up front but then it should be if i get that process in place it should just keep keep going that way i'm I'm kind of alluding to like, how do I keep from filling my plate back up with that day to day stuff so that next year it's like, oh my gosh, look at my plate. I filled it up with all these tasks that I shouldn't be doing. Any suggestions on how I keep my plate manageable? Mm. It's easy to do. I, I'm guilty of doing it. So, you know, when things change quickly, I like to change quickly too. All right. And I'm like, oh, I'll go do all this work. And then I do have accountability, I would say, from my one, specifically my one business partner, Igor Trinanek, who is highly process oriented. He's the exact opposite to me. He's very just like corporate level mentality. And, and every time I get ADD and distracted by things, he's like, Danny, like, no, you need to learn yourself how to say no. And I think for a lot of us, it's that simple understanding of does this new idea contribute to the goal and where we're heading or does it distract us from it and don't just take your own word from it for, from you like ask your team you know your team will be incredibly honest if you're as long as you have a good relationship with them my team constantly is like danny that sounds like a big distraction and i'll be so excited about it one week and then the next week i'll be like you know what? that's nothing but but fluff you know example of this is recently with this downturn we had i went and did a ton of research on grants and things that we can education grants that we can give um, our members and, and new people signing up it's quite a complicated process and it actually really just doesn't work well for what we're doing but at the time i was super excited about it i was like trying to tell our sales team we should offer this in every single sale we do it takes up to six months to get 50 percent of a grant that you may or may not get it like it's really just like not that conducive to what we're doing right now and my team just looked at me like that sounds like a big distraction and i had to kind of like put my ego down for a second and be like, you're right. That's not actually where we should go right now. And we shouldn't do that. So learning to say no is big and having structure to how you keep up this process, right? So every December we do quarterly planning. Every quarter we sit down and do a review on that planning. Every week uh, we actually do something called GSNR, stands for goal setting and review. So I report to Igor. My sales team then reports to me, right? And if we have a team below them, they would then report to them. And everybody has a reporting mechanism where every week we have goals and accountability on our quarterly plan. 
we're all shooting towards the end of the quarter and we all have to week by week break those goals down to weekly little initiatives and things we've got to go do and see how we do and review on it and we all have someone accountable or that, that we're accountable to to report to you know all of our members we have 300 of them report to their coach those members then have a team they have sales production and financial teams those teams report to the owner those teams then run the team below them and everybody has a structure of accountability to keep everyone on track in the right direction absolutely and i think i think the big thing there and we we actually talk about it in a couple other episodes is making sure you hire good teams take care of your teams and get to where you trust the team you have you know you've built the trust with igor for Igor to be able to tell you, hey, we need a better process for this, and you understand your strengths, and you understand Igor's strengths, and you say, you know what, you're probably right, let's do this, um, it's, o- it's okay. And I think a lot of times that that's a hard step for business owners, but it's it's gotta be a f- very freeing feeling when you have that team and you say, wow, I trust them, they make suggestions, they're gonna be good suggestions, and we can you know look at it, analyze it, but then let's get this thing put into place. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, this whole thing, we talked a little bit there when we were on a break. I want to put this into a more structured webinar. I think this, this whole topic is very important. Um, I want to leave with something, and I'm guessing this will be something where almost all business owners are going to struggle with this. But, you know, it's taking time away from the day-to-day to steer the ship in the right direction. How important is it? also as a business owner to take time away from the business in general and and steer your ship you know making sure that your mind is in the right spot that you know you're spending time with your family and friends those kind of things uh i know it's something that you're passionate about and you talk about so talk to like how important that is in your eyes yeah i've got three girls at home all under the age of five or five and under (laughs) so life is busy at home um it's interesting i I have always looked at business as a bit of a game. I think a lot of us tell us our business success and failure of it defines who we are. That's a very dangerous place to be, right? Because business can do well, it can do extremely well, or it can do extremely poorly. And if it's defining who you are, you end up putting it in front of everything else. And what I think if you talk to a lot of people who are older than you and I, Michael, like they simply just say like, look, the relationships you built in your life are the most important things that you'll ever want and need. And I always keep reminding myself of something. Do you remember in high school how much we cared about being cool and like maybe getting good grades or whatever? Like it was like the everything. Like if I said what's up in the hallway to somebody and they didn't say what's up back, like I felt terrible. You remember that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> we cared so much about those things. And yet here we are now in our 30s and 40s and we're like, all we care about is career success. And if I can just be you know, good at business or make money, then everything's going to be awesome. And I believe that's another big lie that we probably tell ourselves because we're too young to understand what happens next. And if you talk to people in their 60s and people in their 70s, they say, you know what, that was all great, but that wasn't really what mattered. What mattered was the relationship she built along the way. And I'm trying to keep my head kind of in that space along the way because it's very easy to get distracted by the big machine of business and the big corporate American way of doing things. But you look at the, the, the case studies of people who give up everything to be successful and usually they're not very happy. And we all kind of look at that and we're like, oh, that's weird. I don't understand that. But it's because they gave up everything to be successful. And it's important. Like I take every weekend off. Since the day we started Breakthrough Academy, I've maybe worked like five weekends in five years, like maybe one weekend a year. Other than that, that's like family time. You know, like you know, the other day, like we had my wife's birthday. It's like me and her just alone, COVID-19 birthday, um, just alone hanging out. And, you know, the next day, let's do a barbecue. And, like, let's just make sure we fill our weekends with valuable space and time with my kids. Um, doesn't mean I'm never working. I work a lot. But I really try and block schedule 8 a.m. to 6.30 at night on weekdays and with Saturdays and Sundays completely off. Right. And so my 6.30 on is dinner and time with the kids. My Saturday and Sundays, time with the kids and family. And, and also, you know what, some weekends time for myself, because if it's all about everyone else too, I can lose myself a bit. And I try and just have a bit of space for business, space for family and space for myself. So, yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. That's honestly, that's probably advice I needed today. Like I look at my schedule sometimes and I, you know, I wear myself out and I think that's something that, that in business it's easy to do. Uh, but that's, that's awesome advice. I think if, if you guys made it to the end of this, you got a, a golden nugget right there from Danny. Um, Danny, as always, it's it's awesome having you on. Really appreciate you joining us today. Um, go ahead and uh, 
you know, check out Danny, check out Breakthrough Academy, guys. Uh, definitely worth the time to check them out. And, you know, awesome advice. Danny, thank you so much. And we will see you guys next week. Got it, Michael. Thanks for having me. Let's talk about it.